Hey everyone, welcome to mini lecture number seven from our therapies unit. This is our final mini lecture from therapies, and it's also our final mini lecture for the course, which makes me a little bit sad. Uh, okay, let's get into it. So the biomedical therapies are interventions that change the brain's electrochemical state with psychotropic drugs, magnetic impulses, or even electrical currents or surgery. Um, these biomedical interventions can be used on their own or in combination with psychotherapy, just depending on the individual. Psychopharmacology is the study of the effects of drugs on the mind and behavior. So let's talk through a couple of examples of uh, pharmacological interventions that we can use in therapy. There are antipsychotics. These are prescription drugs that are used to treat psychotic symptoms, as the name might imply, so disorders like schizophrenia. These are also called neuroleptics. Early antipsychotics like uh, clopromazine uh, under its trade name Thorazine, which you may have heard of. Early antipsychotics are dopamine antagonists, which means that they interfere with dopamine's ability to signal. They sort of just prevent um, any dopamine from doing its The theory being that uh, many of the problems seen in disorders like schizophrenia are caused by overactivity of the dopamine system. Now, without getting too much into the weeds on that, that's not uh, the full explanation. Basically, we have overactivity of dopamine in some regions and underactivity of dopamine in others. Uh, as a result, um, this type of therapy was really only effective for um, positive and cognitive symptoms and did not do much for uh, negative symptoms. So it might be effective for things like disordered thought or um, hallucinations, but will not uh, help with things like flat affect. In addition, these early antipsychotics were poorly tolerated and had many very unpleasant side effects, which led to uh, poor compliance with patients taking their medications. And what we would call a revolving door phenomenon, where patients would be admitted, seek treatment, get stabilized on medication, be released, and then sort of fall off taking their medication and get into trouble again and be readmitted. So um, here's a little illustration of how um, these early antipsychotics might work. We have here in green our early antipsychotic which is basically just getting in the way of these dopamine receptors. And when a dopamine is released, uh, the dopamine can't bind because there's something in the way. So basically the way these early antipsychotics worked was just by getting in the way of dopamine and not letting it really do its thing. Uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about is atypical uh, antipsychotics, such as clozapine, which are a more modern class of antipsychotics. These are, to describe the mechanisms of action is a little bit beyond uh, our pay grade here. So just sort of know that they have a complex pharmacological profile that varies a little bit based on medication. Um, which neurotransmitters are affected and to which extent varies a lot based on what medication we're talking about. So dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine can all be affected to varying degrees based on what sort of atypical antipsychotic we're talking about. And the way that these, these interact with these systems also varies. But um, these are generally better tolerated and have fewer side effects and are more effective in the treatment of negative symptoms. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that it's a good time to be on an atypical antipsychotic, but it's a better time than being on a uh, early antipsychotic. Okay, let's talk a little bit about anti-anxiety medication. These are, as you might expect, prescription drugs that are used to treat anxiety. Uh, the first class we're talking about is benzodiazepines, which are benzo class drugs. These reduce anxiety by enhancing GABA signaling. Um, as you may or may not know, GABA is the principal inhibitory neurotransmitter in our central nervous system. So basically GABA signaling serves to dampen down or reduce um, neuron activity. It makes neurons less likely to fire. Um, your book actually has a, a little bit of an inaccuracy. They say this in increases GABA signaling. That's not technically true. Uh, what benzos do is they enhance GABA signaling. So they they make GABA signaling more effective um, when it does take place. So it actually enhances the ability of GABA to um, inhibit neural activity rather than um, in increasing the levels of GABA per se. It's, the nit, it's a nitpick, but it bothered me. Um, so why does that help? Uh, among other things, this can reduce uh, norepinephrine signaling. So norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter that's really, really important for um, modulation and carrying out of stress responses and vigilance and things like that. So too much norepinephrine usually leads to a, um, an anxious uh, state. So many of the anti-anxiety medications that we're talking about work in a roundabout way on this system. 
Uh, benzodiazepines are great because they have rapid efficacy. They take effect very, very quickly and produce a reduction in anxiety uh, very fast. Um, addiction is possible, which is not great, so it's one of the reasons why um, these have to be a bit more regulated in the distribution. Uh, there are many potential drug interactions. So as I mentioned, because this enhances GABA signaling, other drugs such as alcohol that also work on GABA receptors can be potentiated. So if you're on something like a benzo and you take uh, and you drink some alcohol as well, you're going to feel that a lot more than you would if you were um, not on the benzo. So these have lots of potential drug interactions. So people who are using benzodiazepines need to be careful with what they're taking. Uh, benzos also have a good therapeutic index, and basically what that means is uh, there is a wide window between the therapeutic effect, which is um, reduced anxiety, and a toxic effect, which would be something like respiratory depression, right? Um, because it's a GABA agonist, it can, um, it can cause respiratory depression, so trouble breathing. Uh, luckily, there is a big difference between the dose that will produce uh, reduced anxiety and the dose that could be potentially life-threatening, so we say it has a good therapeutic index. Other hypnotics and sedatives, like uh, barbiturates, for example, um, don't have a good therapeutic index. It's a lot easier to accidentally overdose on something like that, so these are preferred for that reason. Uh, SSRIs, which we will talk about um, later on, are also effective, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These increase the amount of serotonin that's available in the synapse. The mechanism by which this works is really too complicated to get into, but um, it can indirectly reduce norepinephrine activity. This is a go-to treatment because SSRIs don't really have abuse potential, and they tend to be pretty well tolerated as far as anti-anxiety medications go. Uh, I also want to speak briefly about uh, Buspirone or Buspar. Uh, this is another anti-anxiety medication that is also less preferred than benzo-class drugs. It's a serotonin agonist, so it works in a similar fashion to the SSRIs, but through a different mechanism. Uh, this can help, the nice thing about this is it can help to treat the depression that often accompanies anxiety. Uh, and it's also not accompanied by sedation, confusion, or mental clouding, which can be side effects of uh, other sedatives. Another nice thing about this is it does not enhance um, depressant effects of alcohol or other CNS depressants, so it doesn't interact with things like benzos or alcohol uh, in a negative fashion, so there's less care needed with um, what's being taken in. Uh, there's little to no dependence or withdrawal with this class of drug either, so it has far less abuse potential, but the main reason you don't see this administered quite as often is because it's less effective, so it's less, it produces a less dramatic reduction in anxiety, and it requires more dosing, so you have to take it more often because it, it wears off more quickly. Um, because of those and other reasons, it's also less good for intermittent users, so oftentimes people will take something like um, a benzo class drug, uh, when they have something stressful coming up, right? So if you're prone to stress and you have a big presentation coming up, you might take a Valium or something like that um, prior to that, uh, but you you might not uh, want to be taking it every day. Okay, so lithium. Uh, lithium is used to treat bipolar disorder. Um, this counteracts both the manic and depressive symptoms in bipolar patients, so it serves to sort of like a mood stabilizer. This can uh, preview, prevent acute manic episodes after it's been administered for about a week or two. Um, this has to be closely monitored for potentially toxic effects. So this doesn't have as big of a therapeutic index as we would like. So you have to be very careful with how much lithium uh, is being administered and making sure that the client is, is uh, safe and not uh, reaching toxic levels. Uh, a funny thing, I guess, or an interesting thing about lithium is the mechanism is complex and not extremely well understood. We know a lot of things that lithium does, but we don't know exactly what combination of these effects is um, causing the mood stabilization to take place. It affects dopamine, glutamate, and GABA neurotransmitter systems, as well as several complicated intracellular signaling systems. This is very far beyond um, the level of depth we want to go into in this course, so we're not going to talk much more about that. But basically, uh, lithium works on all these different systems um, and serves to stabilize mood and bipolar disorder through a mechanism that we don't completely understand. But it works! Okay, so let's talk a bit about antidepressants. These are prescription drugs that are used to reduce the symptoms of major depressive disorder, as you might expect. Uh, the first generation of antidepressants, uh, circa the 1950s or so, uh, were tricyclics and MAOIs. Um, tricyclics mainly act as uh, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, uh, but they have many off-target effects. So 
I'll explain what I mean by a reuptake inhibitor here in just a moment. Um, MAOIs are monoamine oxidase inhibitors. They do what it sounds like. They inhibit the action of monoamine oxidase. Monoamine oxidase is an enzyme that breaks down uh, monoamines, so neurotransmitters like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So the idea behind MAOIs is that if we have a deficiency in something like serotonin and norepinephrine, if we sort of take out the machinery that breaks these things down, the stuff that we have is going to stick around for longer. It'll signal for longer before it's broken down. So normally what happens is stuff like serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine is released, and then it is taken back up into the cell or broken down by enzymes. So these two mechanisms work to sort of halt those options. If the, the main goal with these drugs is the neurotransmitter stays out in the synapse longer and does its thing for longer, um, so it has a greater effect. These are effective, but they have a slow induction time. So um, they could take something like two to six weeks to reach full efficacy. And if you have someone you can imagine that is extremely depressed, that may be too long to wait, uh, which is a major drawback. Um, and there are also some uh, major side effects because these drugs are not very specific. So let's talk a bit about modern antidepressants. So SSRIs, which you've probably heard of, are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and they do what they sound like. They um, inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. So an example of this would be something like Prozac, which will increase the availability of serotonin. Uh, because it's more selective to serotonin, there are less side effects, and the side effects are milder. SNRIs are serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and they do what they sound like. They prevent the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. So here is a little um, graphic of how that action might work. Here we have Clozaril, which is a SSRI. What it does is sort of gets in the way of the transport mechanism that normally takes serotonin up after it's done its thing. Uh, and when serotonin binds to its receptor and then uncouples, it can't be taken back up into its releasing neuron, so it sticks around in the synapse longer and continues to bind. So this artificially increases the level of serotonin that's available, right? Just through this sort of simple mechanism of preventing it from being taken out. Um, it sticks around longer and continues to bind to do its thing. SNRIs are similar, except they also work at uh, nor nor norepinephrine transporters. So let's take another look at this mechanism, because I feel like this might be uh, a little bit confusing for, for some. Uh, the idea of inhibiting reuptake is something that many medications rely on. Uh, they stop the neuron from taking back its chemical messages. It's sort of a simple way to say it. So here we have the sending neuron that is releasing its neurotransmitters across the synapse that are doing their thing. Normally what happens here is neurotransmitters go out, and then they are uncoupled and released and go back into the sending neuron. If we have something like Prozac on board, which is SSRI, it gets in the way of those transporters. So it blocks the door that these serotonin molecules will normally go back through. So instead of going back, they stay out in the synapse longer, keep bouncing around, keep binding and doing their thing. So we have artificially increased serotonin activity, right? Cool. So uh, electroconvulsive therapy, this often surprises people that it still exists, right? Because this is sort of uh, in many people's minds like a horror movie kind of thing, but it's really not how you are probably picturing it. It's not the rough force electroconvulsive therapy of the uh, 30s when we didn't really have a good medical model for dealing with mental illness. Uh, ECT to nowadays is accompanied by gentle anesthetic and muscle relaxant to prevent damage from the seizure activity. Uh, 30 to 60 seconds of electrical current are passed through via stimulating electrodes. Uh, the patient is monitored throughout the procedure to ensure that they are safe. Um, 30 to 60 seconds of electrical current, which results in a mild seizure. Three sessions a week for three to four weeks. It will produce some memory loss, but um, no permanent brain damage. This is a very effective treatment for treatment-resistant patients. So if you have a patient that isn't responding well to pharmacological therapy or talk therapy, ECT is sort of extreme, but can produce dramatic reversal of symptoms. Uh, though relapse is not uncommon, people often fall back into um, depressive state. Um, but yeah, surprisingly enough to, to many, ECT is a viable and still carried out uh, treatment for uh, depression. Uh, in addition to this, we have repeated transcranial magnetic stimulation which uh, we have an image of down here. We basically have a coil-shaped magnet that can stimulate um, nervous tissue transdermally or transcranially, so through the skull. Uh, 
Uh, this coil stimulates the targeted brain region via magnetic pulses, which will produce modest results. One application we've seen for this is by increasing function in the left frontal lobe, which can lead to the formation of new neural connections by enhancing synaptic plasticity, or the ability of neurons to make new connections. Uh, deep brain stimulation is another method I want to mention here briefly. Basically, this is an implanted electrode that delivers periodic stimulation. You can think of it a lot like a pacemaker, but it's in your brain. Uh, this, uh, there's an experimental therapy that I wanted to mention here that targets the bridge between the frontal lobes and the limbic system. Um, this region tends to be overactive in depressed patients, so by sort of using this uh, deep brain stimulation to um, stimulate and regulate activity in this, in this pathway, uh, 12 to 20 patients in this trial experienced relief over the course of three to six years. Okay, so before we uh, wrap up, I know I'm running a little bit long, but I wanted to say thank thank you to all of you for a fantastic semester. It's unfortunate that we've had to do the, the last half of our semester remotely, but I really enjoyed getting to know all of you. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you around in the future, hopefully in the fall. If you like all of this uh, psychopharmacology type stuff, I highly recommend that you uh, take psychopharmacology, possibly with me in, in the coming spring. Uh, it's a great class. I have a lot of fun teaching it. Um, Oh, and I guess before we go, I want to mention, uh, if you have not filled out your course evaluations for me for this course, I'd really appreciate it if you could do that. Um, not only do I use all of that information to sort of shape my teaching by taking your feedback into account with what worked and what didn't work for you, it's also really important for uh, my sort of professional development in the sense that people who formally evaluate my, my teaching and make recommendations based on that uh, will take all that stuff into consideration. So yeah, please do provide me with your honest feedback if you have a chance to do so. I'd appreciate that. All right, um, that wraps things up for this semester. Uh, good luck on the final exam and getting all of your uh, experimental credits in before things wrap up. And hopefully I will see all of you around in the fall.